oneness that knows the truth of who we are and of who our brothers and sisters are. You know, we know in that moment that there, there are Israelis and there are Palestinians, but there are our brothers and sisters more. And they are Israelis and they are Palestinians and they are human beings more. And there are Ukrainians and there are Russians, but they are brothers and sisters. And there are Ukrainians and there are Russians, but they are human beings as well. And when we see some of the awful things taking place, defendable or undefendable within whoever's viewpoint of what it is, we can see that the ultimate truth can easily be forgotten. And so it's up to us to develop that consciousness that can remember, that doesn't get caught up in titles, and that remembers that the deepest truth, the highest truth, and the most correct truth is to come from that place of love. I love something that our own Reverend Peggy Price wrote on our minister's listserv last night. She said, please simply focus, referring to all the crap going on in the world, please simply focus on peace beginning here and now within yourself. It's not about one side or another. It's about one of us. And since we each have ownership of that one of us, we can respond to whatever is going on around us. To me, again, you know, the Christ isn't an individual. It's a collective it's a shared consciousness. If anything that I see in the ministry of Jesus as we read them in the Gospels, it's about inspiring, not worshiping. It's about commitment, not surrender. It's about living up to our highest standards of who we are uh, so that each of us can be responsible for our own lives. We see this in the Gospels when it's not so much the power of Jesus that helps and reforms people, but it's their own faith and belief. There's the woman who touches Jesus' garments. The story goes like this. There was a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years who had suffered much at the hands of many doctors and had spent everything she had and was not helped at all, but rather became worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came through the dense crowd from behind him and touched his cloak, for she said, If I can only touch his cloak, I shall live. And immediately the hemorrhage was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Jesus instantly knew that some power had gone out of him. So he turned around to people and said, Who touched my garments? His disciples said to him, You see the people pressing against you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he was looking around to see who had done this. But the woman, frightened and trembling because she knew what had happened to her, came and fell before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, My daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Your faith has healed you. The story of the centurion. A centurion approached Jesus and appealed to him, saying, My Lord, my boy is lying in the house, paralyzed and suffering greatly. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion then answered, saying, My Lord, I am not good enough for you to enter under the shadow of my roof, but just say a word and my boy will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, and there are soldiers under my command. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to the other, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he was amazed, and he said to those who accompany him, Truly I say unto you, that not even in Israel have I found such faith as this. So Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done unto you according to your belief. And his boy was healed in that very hour. Let it be done unto you according to your belief. Even in the Gospel of Mark, we have Jesus' family issues come up. And they're the people that know him the best. They go to town where he's preaching, and they say, Jesus? You know, Jesus, Jesus, what are you saying? <laughs> that's that's our, our kid. We know him from playing ball, from doing whatever it is. And Jesus, when he's in the town that day, there's no healings that take place. There's nothing powerful that occurs. Even he's unable to do it because the people don't believe. The people don't believe in him. They don't believe in himself. And so I think there's a powerful hidden message there when it comes to how we live in our own lives and how we live in the world around us. Are we willing to be stewards of the belief? Are we willing to be shareholders in the living spirit? Are we willing to respond to any tragedy, no matter how dark and difficult, with our knowledge of the power of love, of harmony, of unity. It's easy to give up. It's hard to respond. 
But that's why things like community and conversation and listening and authenticity and deepening become important because they open the peak holes. They open the door for this living spirit to come through. Another quote today from Meister Eckhart. So instead of 2,000 years ago, only about 500 years ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> but he said, God does not give us anything in order that we should enjoy its possession and rest content with it, nor has he ever done so. All the gifts which he has ever granted us in heaven or on earth were made solely in order to be able to give us the one gift, which is himself. With all other gifts, he simply wants to prepare, prepare us for that gift, which is himself. And all that the works which God has ever performed in heaven or on earth serve solely to perform the one work, that is to sanctify himself so that he can sanctify us. And so I tell you that we should learn to see God in all gifts and works, neither resting content with anything nor becoming attached to anything. For us, there can be no attachment to our particular manner of behavior in this life, nor has this ever been right, however successful we may have been. So the idea here is not to see a world where God makes everything happen in order for us to serve or understand more deeply. It's the understanding that we as human beings have the capacity to take anything that's happening in our lives and to turn and give it to God, to give it to that spiritual understanding so that we may in turn be a channel for greater peace first in our own lives but for the one in everything and everywhere. So returning to that question of how we can best love in our own lives, one another, and the world around us, I invite you to ponder what that looks like for you. Again, it's not about wiping the slate clean. It's not about forgetting. It's about remembering why we're here in the first place. It's about remembering what is most sacred and important to you in your life, and it's letting go of any distraction, illusion, disorientation that takes you away from living your life in accordance with what you care about, with what you want, and what is most meaningful and sacred to you. So just taking a prayerful moment in that spirit of God is, life is, I am. Knowing that whatever follows those can indeed be anything, but may we respond to those statements completed themselves, God is, life is, I am, with our wholehearted being, allowing them to reveal through us our true nature, the true state of our relationships, the true potentiality of brotherhood and sisterhood all around us, knowing that what we do here together indeed makes a difference. It indeed ripples out. It indeed is important. It indeed is meaningful. We claim it to be so. We are transformations and demonstrations in our own selves. And so it is all men. Oh, so, all men. so thanks for your time, everyone.